our YouTube uh, live stream um, while I introduce the, the, the content of uh, today's uh, webinar. Um, so we are uh, very uh, happy um, to host uh, this webinar with uh, Pong Lei uh, today. Uh, so today's webinar title is uh, Subversive, Sub Subversive Incident and a Gesture of Refusal, uh, DACO and Underground Music in the PRC. And so our guest lecturer is, today is uh, Pong Lei. Uh, so she obtained uh, her PhD in Transcultural Studies uh, on Chinese rock and roll music and uh, Chinese uh, rock music and contestation um, in 2013 in France, in uh, Lyon 3, I think, Lyon 3. Um, she, she's currently a lecturer in Chinese studies at the University of Liverpool uh, in the UK. And her research interests are broadly focused on uh, popular and alternative music culture in China and the concept of modernity, uh, the relationship between uh, subculture and uh, youth culture in the social transformation of modern China. So she is also interested in studies about the mind and consciousness, the formation of self-perception, as well as the quest for transcendence and spirituality in the cultural sphere of greater China. Um, so for today, we're going to talk about uh, the DACO phenomenon uh, in China, and uh, it's linked to the underground uh, rock culture. Um, so throughout the 90s and the early 2000s. Um, so again, uh, thank you, uh, Lei, for coming uh, today. And uh, a big welcome uh, here uh, at our uh, webinar series. Um, thank you, Nadal, uh, for the introduction. Uh, hello, good morning, good afternoon, good evening uh, to you. I don't know where you are. Oh, yes, um, that's true. Very, yeah, <laughs> uh, I'm very happy to join this uh, webinar with uh, Nadal. And thank you for providing opportunities uh, to talk about DACO and underground uh, music scene of in the early uh, early centuries of these current centuries, and uh, I'm very happy to have this conversation with you um, because we both have been observing and uh, writing, uh, doing some research about Chinese rock and roll, uh, the youth cultural, and underground music, uh, but we haven't got opportunities to really sit and uh, talk and share our observation and thinkings. And so uh, I'm particularly happy to talk about DACO today because this is a phenomena that uh, is relatively uh, hardly talked, especially the economic side, the material practical side of this uh, special cultural phenomena is uh, rarely talked and also is really known by the outside world uh, so I think it's a very good opportunity to, to talk about it with you and also to make some invisible factors of this history uh, visible in some way. And I think it's quite important too because the business itself uh, reveals, in my personal opinion, some mechanism of the uh, hegemony of the colonial modernity that we are living in uh, still in, in our days. Thank you, thank you, Lei. Um, so, so we're gonna we're gonna do like a, a conversation between uh, between us, and um, so so I'm gonna uh, ask some questions. We're gonna we're gonna talk about the DACO phenomenon and uh, uh, what you uh, saw uh, uh, during your research. Um, and also after our conversation, we will uh, open the floor to questions. So of course, people who are watching uh, us uh, on YouTube can ask questions on the comment section, and I will uh, of course. Um, uh, read the comments uh, after uh, uh, we finish our conversation. So maybe the, the, the first question that I have, which is more like a broad uh, definition of DACO. So what is, for the people who don't know, what are the DACOs? Uh, where did they come from? And how did they arrive uh, in China? Sure. Yeah, thank you for the question. I think... Uh... Yes, this is the first the first question is to define uh, what is DACO. And for those who speak Chinese, maybe you know that DACO uh, literally means make a cut or uh, or uh, cut, the make, simply cut. So the DACO cassette or CD are uh, particular 
cassettes and CDs that were sold in the 90s and also early 2000s in mainland China, as far as I know, maybe somewhere else. I'll be very interested to know if uh, in some other places in the world you also have this kind of CD or cassette. So basically those were uh, the surplus of production, CD productions or cassette productions in the uh, US or European market by the big companies. And because the um, because of the, the music industry, uh, the nature of the music industry, those companies uh, will produce uh, a high quantity of uh, cassettes and albums each year. And it's basically a bet. So uh, they would produce maybe more than the, the market required. So there are many surplus of CD or cassettes and how to deal with these cassettes and CDs. Uh, they have to get rid of it at uh, a certain moment. So instead of um, destroying them, uh, recycle them in US or in Europe, and they exported it to Asian countries um, in which uh, of which uh, China and Hong Kong is one of the destinations. So when those uh, cassette on CDs were exported to China, they were exported as a plastic uh, trash. So with very, very uh, low prices. And then when uh, they are exported as a trash, a plastic trash, they have to make a cut on, the, on these cassettes or CDs um, to theoretically damage them so that they, could, they would not be reused or relicensed as a CD or cassette. And then they, when they arrived in, in China, uh, some music amateurs discovered these uh, uh, quotation uh, plastics that could be lessened again. So uh, they started to buy those CDs and cassettes and on black market because it's still illegal in, uh, in, in the mainland China, especially during the nineties. So those CDs and cassettes are called the CD or cassette uh, with the cut. And we created this, this term, which is DACO, making a cut to define uh, those products. So those are like this. This is some explanation of uh, the term itself. So in fact, these uh, CDs and cassettes were cut. So they were they were cut, but they could be listened to. So a CD, for example, uh, if it was cut on the periphery of the CD, yeah. it was it was possible to 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 listen to it still. Yes. Yes. And um, I think um, since we are talking about the definition of DACO and the DACO CD and cassette, it's maybe interesting to mention uh, the origin of this business um, because it's, of course, it's a cultural product in some way, but it's also a business. So, and this, all these phenomena uh, originated from these products are basically driven by a business or driven by the cultural industry or music industry, uh, combining with some general industry. Uh, so I, I think I, I would like to talk about the stories, a story behind the origin of this DACO cassette and CDs. And then I can show you um, one personal collections of DACO CDs. And I think uh, not you also have some uh, videos to show people yeah. how these cassette or CDs are repaired. Right? <laughs> So, um, so the appearance of these tapes or the cassette or the CDs uh, is, uh, like I said, is the surplus of cassette and CDs uh, produced by the big uh, record companies in the US or the Europe market. And they were in, uh, exported as plastic waste into China in the nineties. And the cities that received those uh, trash, those plastic trash are uh, Guangdong, uh, in, in the Guangzhou province, Guangdong and Shantou. So those are like port cities uh, in mainland China. So they receive these, uh, this plastic trash in the big barge. And uh, then they were hiring people in small factories to recycle all the materials uh, for cassettes. They will recycle the cover and then they will uh, separate the uh, plastic with other materials. And then the um, factories will uh, use these materials to produce other plastic products. 
So very possibly the the plastic uh, bags or our plastic mugs are maybe made up by some previous record of, of Robin Williams or or David Bowie in the early in the nineties or early two thousands. We never know. And so why? Um, so this, this this is a sales channel basically, and from the uh, U.S. and European market to uh, Asia market and especially in China. So it first arrived in Guangdong, in Shantou, and uh, among all the small cities in the Guangzhou province, there is a place called uh, Heping. Heping, uh, it's a small, it's a small, really small village that I could see you, I could show you a picture of this, uh, the position of this small village. So you can have an idea of the geographic uh, location of this place, because these uh, small cities has become uh, later the center of this uh, black business, dark CD or cassette business. So if you see my screen, yep. uh, we can see this is Hong Kong. It's the south uh, eastern side of China. And uh, this is Guangdong province. And the start place, the started place is called Heping. Uh, Hepingzhen. So this is small, small village in uh, Guangzhou province, and you can see also it very close. It's very close to Hong Kong and Taiwan, and uh, it's also on the coast. So this is the small village that received most of the uh, darko cassettes or CDs as plastic, uh, plastic trash, and then. Uh, in the beginning, they arrived in Hepingzhen. Uh, Hepingzhen, they I, I don't know why Heping, because maybe because they have this tradition of recycled uh, plastic um, from the barge, from the, the importations. Um, so it arrived Heping firstly as the real plastic trash. So people would just dissemble all these uh, CDs and cassettes and uh, recycle them and then send them to other factories. But uh, at a certain point, uh, some music amateurs, uh, according to some interviews I, I, I have uh, listened to, there's a professor called uh, Ye Lao Shi, uh, Professor Ye, who worked in Shantou University at that moment, uh, made a trip to Heping and discovered really by chance those uh, recycled plastic trash. And he then realized uh, those are cassettes and CDs that are still uh, listenable and just need some more operations to make it uh, use, to make it um, work again. Of course, you might lose some tracks or you might lose part of the songs, uh, but it still can be used. So he discovered these and uh, started to buy them. And uh, some of the people who work in these factories so the factories to recycle and disassemble uh, those plastic trash, they also realized very quickly um, that there are people who are interested in buying uh, those cassette CDs with a much higher prices than they expected. So they started to um, pick up some cassettes or CDs that were demanded by those amateurs aside and then resell them. And those people are called a small boss, xiao lao ban. So those are the, uh, the, the first vague of the small business established within the factory. And though this, those uh, they, they, they don't have enough music knowledge. So we are in the 90s or the early 2000s before the uh, flourish of internet and China uh, still uh, just, we, we still uh, are lacking a lot of um, information, especially rock and roll musician uh, music related information. So they hired uh, those xiao lao ban, small bosses, they have to hire uh, the music amateurs to pick the cassette and CDs for them. So the second business chain are est established like this. So they hired music amateurs. Uh, the, among those music amateurs, many of them have created websites, forums, online forums, and also be involved in a uh, rock magazines later in, in mainland China. So they selected the CD and cassettes for those small bosses. And then um, a second 
supply chain has established and they then they will send all these picked Kassian cities all over China. So there are a big black market um, established like this. So that's the, the details, some details uh, regarding this business. And uh, to show you some images about this business. So it's, it's really um, not only about rock and roll, peace and love. So if we look at the, the, the realistic side of this business, we can see some not so uh, peace and love images related to this business. So I would show you some uh, images about the factories the factories that receive those cassettes and CDs and the, uh, who, uh, uh, the, the, who the workers are like recycling and dissembling those uh, cassette and CDs. So these were uh, screenshots, some excerpt from the music uh, magazine, uh, So Rock, one of the major Chinese underground music magazines in the 90s and early 2000s. And this is a report from a music amateur who went to Herpin and to to kind of uh, pay tribute to the cradle of, uh, uh, of their music uh, knowledge. So these are like pictures of people who work in these small factories and to recycle the materials from cassettes and CDs. And you can see it's uh, far, from, um, far from satisfying the working condition. And those uh, kids, they also play with the recycled uh, materials um, happily, <laughs> and they don't really know what they are recycling. So those are uh, pictures about the factories. And those are the boxes uh, with the CDs or cassettes that are being cut and being recycled. And those are like materials they disassembled and uh, are going to send to other factories to produce some plastic product. So those are some images um, that I would like to show you to make this aside uh, visible in some way. So this is um, a very brief introduction about the business behind uh, this taco business. I think it's 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 very interesting to talk about the business side because we we tend to only talk about Daco when we talk about music and music appropriation by, by young Chinese in the 90s and we don't talk about uh, the business side or the material side of people going through uh, all this uh, plastic uh, waste and uh, bringing them uh, into the black market so I think it's a, it's, it's a really important thing to to do is to to understand that it was uh, a market also where people uh, uh, exchanged uh, these uh, plastic materials against, you know, money. Um, I have a, 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 a very small uh, question about the operation of DACO because um, uh, for a long time I was uh, trying to find when it appeared for the first time uh, in China. Mm -hmm. And the, the earliest testimony that I got was uh, in 92 people talking okay. about Shanto uh, mm. and the Daco uh, apparition in Shanto, in fact. So do, do you have any other information uh, about like the, the, the really beginning uh, of Daco in China? Is, is it earlier or, or we are in the 92, uh, something like that? I'm sorry, I have no more information than you. I think 92 might be a, I might be a year that Darko business started. Yeah, because I, I think also the, the fact that Shanto was a, and still is a special economic zone. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, in 92, so Deng Xiaoping uh, went into the South uh, to continue the, 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 the economic reform. Yeah. Um, that may explain maybe uh, the apparition of Darko in mm -hmm. this year. So in 92 with the, the opening up and reforms, uh, that mm. were uh, coming out uh, in the in the early nineties, so so maybe it's uh, it's uh, mm. it's, uh, it's something that happened in ninety two, yeah, yeah. So 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 that's the way yeah, the, the the earliest testimony. It's ninety two, ninety three, that I found. Yeah, me too. Actually, I uh, from the from the materials I have been looking, uh, the earliest date 
uh, about DACO is 1992. Mm. And I also listened to a conversation between one of the musicians in, in Tang Dynasty, Tang Chao, uh, uh, Kaiser Guo, who uh, have been studying in mainland China before the 1989. And he left China after that event and then come back in, in the early 90s. And according to his memory, the old days Daco cassette CDs also appeared uh, in the early 90s. So one of the reasons maybe it's the, uh, it's the tour, the Southern tour of Deng Xiaoping. It's, yeah, it's very, it's very possible. Yeah, no, I think it's possible too. Um, to, to continue on the DACO and to give uh, our viewers a more precise knowledge of what a DACO is and uh, how to repair a cassette. So I've taken a, a short excerpt of a documentary by Jadali uh, called uh, Nirvana and Pop, the story of Scrap City in China. Uh, it's a two minute uh, video clip and I will, uh, I will share it with you and we can uh, talk about it uh, afterward. So just wait a moment and share the clip. <笑>那时候最喜欢的我让你买了 我问了磁带好像都是三十块钱一盘然后就觉得不行回去可能得攒钱了然后后来我们俩那个就是合计好了一个对策都去他们家吃饭然后他们家给他准备的饭吧反正也够我们俩吃然后我们那饭费当时好
or the surplus of productions. And about the cut on the CD, I don't know if you can see it. Yeah. So you have a small cut here and uh, most of the time it will cut maybe one sum on the CD. And if the cut is smaller than this, this is a really nice cut. You don't you basically don't lose any track, but sometimes you have a very big and uh, profound cuts where you lose more. So these CDs, I, I'm still listening to it now. And it's still one of the best collections of music uh, of cinema that I, I have ever had. And so, yeah, it's very interesting to, to see that uh, something you bought 20 years ago uh, in China where you didn't have access to a lot of music uh, product and information now is uh, still with me while I'm literally living in the country where all these products were, <laughs> were produced. So it's a very interesting um, coincidence uh, between the personal journey, personal listening journey and the journey of these, uh, these CDs, these, these products. And it, it's really interesting to see that it's not only rock and roll music because we talk about rock and roll music a lot, but every uh, musical genre was represented uh, in the DACO from classical music uh, to pop music to underground and grunge uh, music at the same time. So it was really a wide range of uh, uh, music that was uh, uh, possible to, 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 to buy uh, on the black market. Um, so maybe. Um, a small question on the selling part of the DACO. Uh, so yeah. how was it sold uh, on the, the, the black market of the uh, major Chinese cities uh, at the time? Mm. It's, yeah, thank you for the, for the question. It's very interesting to talk about this too. So uh, as I mentioned, these are those uh, small bosses who worked in, in the factory they started to pick up CDs and cassettes and hire people to pick up the valuable uh, ones for them. And then uh, those uh, small bosses, they were sent, they were sell all those uh, pick up the CD and cassette to the major cities, uh, record owners, for example, uh, bookstore owners, and all those record owners, bookstore owners, and are themselves music amateurs, uh, most of the cases. And uh, we also have to bear in mind that in the 90s and uh, early 2000s, internet are still underdeveloped. Uh, as far as I remember, the, the internet started, really started to flourish and um, st starting from the mid 2000s in, in, in China. Um, but uh, in the late 90s, it's pretty much uh, steer a word um, closed to the outside world. So people are really longing for different music and the rock and roll, pop, uh, hip hop, punk, and all, all rounders, all styles mixed, they were steer just names for most of the music amateurs. And then we have to talk about music magazines. So when you, when you just read, uh, music titles, uh, the singer names and the record names, you have developed a huge imagination about these sounds. And uh, the imagination were formed basically by the, the informations uh, introduced on the music magazines. The music magazines actually played a very important role in uh, forming people's imagination during this specific period about uh, all kinds of different music, not only rock and roll. Rock and roll is uh, quite special because it's, uh, it's, it has a connotation of rebellions, uh, of uh, this heroic image of uh, anti-social order or anti-established order. So it becomes uh, quite special around us. But actually in the, night, in the late 90s, all kinds of music, uh, including Madonna, uh, the pop icon, uh, Michael Jackson, and also country music, and all those are considered as new music or modern music because it's different from what we can see, what we can hear from the mainstream media. Uh, so all this music uh, 
or just imagination when you can't buy them. So when uh, some music amateurs develop these longings or imaginations, they wanted to buy them. And most of them uh, have uh, established their own record store or bookstores because they're interested in, in culture basically. Then they will um, buy those cassettes or CDs with cards from these little bosses. So it's a underground channel because it's the illegal. It's uh, highly censored and, and uh, sanctioned by the Chinese authorities. And so it's basically very secret. You can't really see the advertisement of this stack of CDs or cassettes. And they will just send them by post, imagine, or they will just go to Guangzhou or to Heping and bring them back themselves. But in each major cities, at least in cities, um, there are at least one or two uh, places that are well known by the music amateurs who, who have these stucco cassette to CDs. And the boss, the owners of these shops are mostly um, very knowledgeable uh, about music. So they will recommend CDs or cassettes when you go to their shops, but they don't sell them openly either. So in, for example, you have a, you have a record shop, you have bookstore, you could just put uh, this uh, this uh, so-called legal uh, cassette or CDs or books on the outside or publicly uh, displayed, but you will keep all these cut CDs and, and cassettes in the box and behind, often it's behind the door or under your bed. I remember, I still remember my first experience of buying those uh, DACO cassettes and CDs I uh, went back to the 90s, uh, mid 90s, when I was um, a, a college student, a high school student. Then uh, I start, I see a peop, I see someone who, who sell CDs on, on the streets, but it's very mystical because it's only five or four CDs and with a small black bag beside her, <laughs> beside him. And I started to look at these CDs and he asked me, do you want more? I have more. I said, <laughs> yes, of course. But then he said, you, sh you should follow me. Uh, they are not here. <laughs> it's just samples. Uh, I just bring some samples with me. So I was following him to, and, and it, he, he lived in this very um, dark and shabby <laughs> small buildings uh, on a small street in my city, <laughs> Kunming. Uh, and then he put up, pulled out a big box under his bed, literally, with a lot of cut cassettes and CDs. So that was my first personal experience of buying these CDs. And then of course, uh, when we got to know, it's, it's really a small circle of information that you will hear that, oh, these shops or that bookstores, they have this DACO CD or cassette and they just go there and ask the boss. And then it's like a secret code. So you ask him, do you have got, you got DACO? And he would present you. So all these are like uh, quite secret. Um, but the DACO cassette or CDs have reached to almost all the major cities in, in China in a very short period of time. Uh, so that's um, from my personal experience, I can, I can tell you that the business, the circulation of these products and also the selling are all um, very secret. Yeah. And uh, well, I, I think also uh, with with the time, it was more and more open uh, that people uh, were selling that on the on the streets, on the on the roads of the streets. I know that there, there's a lot of uh, testimonies about uh, Wudalco, uh, which is the the, the university uh, quarter in Beijing, and uh, mm -hmm. a lot of um, uh, young people were selling dacos uh, on the streets of the Wudalco, um, mm -hmm. which was the the, the epicenter of uh, the rock and roll and the punk uh, music scene. Uh, in the uh, late 90s, uh, early 2000s. Um, so yeah, there, there was a lot of, of ways to uh, sell and buy uh, tacos uh, on the black market. Um, yeah, yeah. Like a lot of rules in, in, in China, as long as you're not caught, right? Yeah. <laughs> as long as you're not spot, spotted by, <laughs> by local authorities, uh, you are relatively safe. Uh, <laughs> for example, I, buy, I bought my, my personal cut CDs on, on campus. Uh, mm -hmm. yeah. I used to study in Beijing Daxue, mm -hmm. which is very close to Wudalco. Yeah. So I, I have um, some frequent places 
and the CDs I bought uh, was actually sold by one student in the secondhand market on the campus. Mm. And everyone knows that, um, no one questioned about it. It's just it circulated as much as we want. Um, I, I just wanted to make uh, a small comment um, on uh, DACO and the importance of DACO for uh, the, the rock and roll uh, um, uh, underground in China, uh, because we, we talk a lot about DACO uh, in the 90s and it's really important uh, and it was really important for the for the for the young people uh, in the 90s, but it was not the only uh, um, tool of musical appropriation at the time, because before the 90s, there was also a rock and roll uh, um, music scene uh, that was uh, important, uh, mostly in Beijing. And in fact, since the, the late 70s, so after the Mao's death, uh, we had a lot of musical circulation from abroad uh, in China, uh, not only uh, so the, the, the Western uh, CDs uh, and cassettes that were coming in the 90s, but also cassette pirate, uh, pirate cassette and CDs uh, from Hong Kong and Taiwan, and also musical production from China. So it was not the only way uh, to listen to rock and roll music or pop music uh, in China. There was a lot of other uh, ways. Uh, so pirated CDs uh, from Hong Kong and Taiwan, from, from Dong Li Tun or afterward uh, from beyond uh, in, the, in the late 80s. So, so, so just to, to, to say that uh, DACO is very important, but it shouldn't be uh, seen as the only uh, mode of uh, musical appropriation uh, at the time. Yes, yes, I, I totally agree. Uh, actually, I'm, I forgot to mention uh, Shantou, this cities in Guangzhou province, uh, not only is the epicenter or the cradle of all these cut cities and, and uh, cassettes, it's also the once the center of the pirate um, productions, <laughs> cities and, and all these video tapes. Um, I, I got to know this from the interviews I had uh, with the one of the DACO sellers. So he used to work as uh, for these small bosses to pick up CD and cassettes. And he told me that uh, the Shantou, the city itself, is also the epicenter of the pirate <laughs> CDs and also videotapes and also DVDs later. So uh, of course, the pirate productions is one important resources. And actually from the testimonies I collected, most of the music amateurs in 90s, they started to listen to Hong Kong and Taiwan popular music first before uh, getting in con on contact with all this, um, we call it uh, Omei, Liu Xing Ge Qu, the popular music from Europe and US, which is a term that we use to describe all the foreign music uh, on the quotation marks. Uh, but apart from this Europe and US music, we also have a big, big trend of uh, what we call Gang Tai, uh, Liu Xing Ge Qu, the popular music from Hong Kong and Taiwan. Uh, so I think the music um, trajectory, if we wanted to trace it and also to, to draw a map um, about the lessening journey of at least these uh, generation um, identify them as DACO generation, they started to be exposed to music or popular music in Hong Kong and Taiwan and eventually uh, Japan. And then uh, through the pirate products, by the way, um, and the main reason behind this is basically economical because um, the income the personal income in the late 90s are still quite limited. And China was going through a very deep social and economic transformation. Um, a lot of public sectors are privatizing, but people's um, personal income are still quite limited, unless a very, very few uh, niche of, of people who get rich first. So um, because of the limited economic income, they have no choice but uh, to buy some pirate products. And DACO is one of the products they have to, they choose to buy also because of the economical uh, limitation. So yeah, yeah, I totally agree with you that DACO uh, is a very particular 
phenomenon, but it's not the only the only way uh, for those generation Chinese youth generations to get access of the the modern music or, or the outside music. Yes, uh, and talking about the price of uh, dacos uh, at the at the time, um, so we estimate more or less that uh, it was it cost from five to ten uh, yuan at the time, which is like quite a large sum of money uh, uh, at the time, but not so much uh, because like the real uh, CDs uh, cost uh, like ten times more. And uh, what's really interesting, and uh, and you talk about it uh, in your uh, PhD thesis, is that uh, price of dacos also uh, um, uh, changed over time. So, for example, for Nirvana, uh, when Kurt Cobain uh, committed suicide, uh, the price of uh, Nirvana tapes and dacos rose uh, exponential, exponentially. Uh, so it was like 100 or 200 uh, yuan. Uh, one tape or CD, and you talk about uh, it's uh, it's really interesting. At at some point, you talk about a uh, uh, Xiao Lao Ban, uh, mm -hmm. who uh, in fact uh, uh, threw away uh, Nirvana tapes without knowing uh, that it was uh, uh, really pricey. Yeah, yeah, that's what that was a very funny anecdote when I uh, had these interviews with the the, the sellers. He told me that his little boss uh, throw up, basically throw um, a lot of cassettes or CDs of Nirvana uh, without knowing that they would become phenomena. And uh, the the worth the the, the CDs and cassettes of Nirvana he throwed worth a building. Let's say I quote the <laughs> saying of the small boss. And it's also true that thanks to this dark business or black business a lot of uh, those small bosses became very wealthy and uh, alongside with all the businessmen in these port cities, they became what we called the small minority of people get rich first in, in China in the late 90s. Uh, right. Right? <laughs> I, I think uh, Second Hand Rose uh, had a song. Exactly. <laughs> I <hope this. laughs> And um, well, t talking about like the 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 changing price uh, of tacos, it's also uh, important to say uh, that there was uh, a, um, a fantastic work by uh, music lovers um, mm -hmm. to, in fact, uh, talk about uh, these CDs uh, and uh, this music. So, 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 so you talked about uh, just before about magazine, and uh, in fact, the influence of magazine. Uh, on the DACO and the DACO influence on the rock magazine is really interesting also to, to, to talk about. Yes, um, actually before the internet uh, get flourished in, in China, the main channel for Chinese youth or the amateurs, the music amateurs to get more information about um, any foreign music basically, uh, but, but mainly focus on rock and roll. Uh, was through the uh, rock magazine or the music magazines. So uh, from the late 90s to at least the mid 2000s, there were several music magazines that were regularly um, published in, in China and were very well known, very well circulated among the uh, Chinese youth or the music amateurs. And one of that, I still have some samples uh, with me is uh, called Wo Ai Yao Gun Yue. Um, the English name is So Rock. I can show you some, some images and covers of this magazine. And uh, so this is one of the, the major magazines that are uh, circulated, very well circulated in mainland China uh, from late 90s to the early 2000s. So in these, mag uh, so you can see that they have sp special editions. So this one is focused on dark music, so basically gothic, uh, death metal. And uh, this one is also quite focused on the dark side, the dark music. And this one is more uh, various. You can maybe find some familiar uh, record cover on, the, on these uh, pictures. So the music magazines are um, uh, 
um, a very big and a major channel of information for music lovers to get to know the knowledge or to self-taught themselves about music history, especially about the rock and roll uh, history. And one of the magazines uh, that I uh, talked in my, in my PhD thesis uh, actually has um, a column um, called 对话摇滚乐, a conversation about uh, rock and roll. And before you get access to the actual records, the actual music, uh, the only information you can have is through these conversations or through these descriptions by some music critics or music amateurs uh, through their conversation or introduction on the uh, rock magazine. So the rock magazine definitely played an important role in forming um, people's imagination, in some way forming their imagination about the rock and roll as well. And that's why um, I also talked in my, in my PhD thesis and the rock and roll arrived in China and is definitely a appropriation, but this appropriation is actually the remaking of a myth. And this myth is definitely different from the myth that we have formed in in US or in Europe. And so there is a, there's a big uh, gap between our understanding and perceptions of the same music genre, for example, or even about a certain period in music history, uh, basic because of this gap of information. But uh, these magazines, these conversations or descriptions, and also the music critics uh, that write these articles also become a, a driving force or the engineer, <laughs> engineer of, of a, a generation's imagination. So they um, introduce the music or the artist or the genres that they find interesting and through their lens, a generation uh, during this specific period of time, a Chinese generation, youth generation, uh, have get access through the Daco CD and, and, and cassette and pirate CD and cassette, and then formulates their own imagination. So it's basically a, a appropriation, but also a, a, a recreation in my personal opinion, about what is rock and roll, uh, what is, uh, for example, uh, hip hop, or what is a modern music. So it's, a, it's quite an interesting uh, channel and uh, it only existed during a specific period of time um, because with the development of internet, um, basically globally, I would say the paper-based magazines are started to, to vanish because people read using different materials now and uh, we don't really need a magazines to introduce uh, music to <laughs> us anymore. And uh, one phenomenon that came with these music magazines I have to mention is also the, um, the music, uh, the, they also attach a music CDs uh, for, for some of these music magazines they also attached a CD. So it's basically a DIY product. They just put a lot of track that they find interesting or they were introduced in that edition and they put it on the CD that they made by themselves and then sell it with the magazine. This is also a, a very important channel for the, for the youth during the late 90s and early 2000s to get access to the real music. Uh, and I still have a lot of compilations with, with these magazines. And the choice of the tracks that they put on these CDs are completely personal. Uh, so it's basically opinion of the editors, for example, or some contributors of that uh, special editions. So it's, uh, it's highly personal, but in some way it also, mm, it also avoided uh, the overdose of information like we are experiencing now. So some, some people selected some music for you. And if you agree with them, it's a natural way of uh, kind of creating a, a community because you share basically the same music taste. Yeah, so, so the DACO created the, the, this uh, shared community of uh, yeah. music lovers, which is really interesting. 
And uh, I, I also saw some testimonies uh, by uh, rock and roll bands uh, saying that in the 90s, they, they, they were all uh, living together uh, like in the same, uh, not the dormitories or things like that. And uh, they were all coming together and uh, reading uh, rock and roll magazines together and listening uh, to the tapes uh, together. So it created a community uh, of uh, like-minded individuals, in fact, also, it's not only about consumption of music, it's also about creating a community. And I think you, you said that very well uh, about the creation of this rock and roll magazine. And, and I wanted to add that um, what is really interesting also in the change of this magazine, that at the beginning they were offering uh, like this music uh, that they found. And then afterwards, uh, like So Rock Magazine, uh, Why Argunye, uh, also offered uh, music uh, from Chinese bands uh, themselves. So they were like really lesser known uh, bands that recorded themselves uh, their uh, music and sent yeah. them uh, to Wai Yaogunye. And then uh, Wai Yaogunye just published uh, these songs. Uh, so you have the creation also of a music scene uh, by uh, this uh, rock and roll magazine. So for example, that's um, a cassette tape uh, that uh, was sold uh, with uh, Sorok magazine and it was about uh, this one is about punk but uh, afterward they were also selling uh, CDs uh, with their magazines so it's interesting to see that it's also a way uh, to promote uh, Chinese band uh, as well yes I think it's it's a um, kind of a strategy to create your own music circles in some way, because um, up to now, I think most of the Chinese underground music are still unknown uh, to the outside world. Um, one, on one hand, because of the lack of communication, I think, um, that the talk that we're having now is a one attempt, in my opinion, to establish some communications, to let people know what is happening. But in, on the other hand, it's also uh, because of this unequal uh, development of music industry. Um, uh, for example, if you go to Spotify uh, and Google uh, to search for certain Chinese bands, you can't find them. Um, so it's also a fact, a revealed a fact that we still live in a, a quite unequal and uh, uh, quite focused on, on Europe-centered or US-centered uh, uh, music market, at, at least for the, for the music market, I think it's still quite US or Europe-centered. And so you don't really have the equal uh, access uh, to, to, to different music. So you have a lot of access, for example, to, to David Bowie or to, to, rock, to, rock, uh, to Pink Floyd. But if you want to find a band in, in, in underground China. Um, I, I suppose it's the same case for, for some countries in Africa, uh, in, in South uh, America, uh, Latin America, it's maybe not that easy. Um, so to how to promote your music and how to share the creation, uh, artistic creation, uh, if you can't really participate in this major market, then you have to create it your own. So I think that's also a, a natural result that if you have a band in China during the late 90s or early 2000, you want people to listen to your music, you need a platform. In the existed platform, you just can't fit in inside or outside of China. So you have to create something. And these music magazines, I think they actually play this role uh, to create their own thing and to allow people who are interested to share this, uh, the, 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 their passions or their interest. I have one, one other question also on, the, on your view of the DACO generation. So mm -hmm. is DACO, uh, has it created a kind of generation uh, in China uh, that shared the same experiences uh, and uh, how did it develop? Uh, yeah, yeah, thank you for the questions. It's, um, I think it's quite an interesting and also important question. I, 
I think personally, I think uh, these DACO uh, products definitely created a generation um, because it's a phenomena that were that happened during a specific uh, period, and so during a specific time, a specific historical period, uh, we still had the possibilities to uh, listen to music through a quite uh, common channel. So for music amateurs that are interested in not so mainstream music in the late 90s or the 2000s, the only access you can have is through music magazines or music forums. We have a lot of online forums in the late, uh, early 2000s. And uh, it, the internet is not as developed as now. So to access to this music that you're interested in, you have to go through these channels. So basically we still have a common platforms uh, that we have access to some shared information. Um, so that's, uh, this setting allows uh, some formation of identity with some very uh, coherence, uh, let's say musics or coherence of, uh, of values. Uh, while nowadays, I think it's much more difficult to create such communities or we can't maybe say that we have a generation uh, that can be titled or can be uh, defined with the title because uh, experience are so fragmented uh, listening experience are so personalized and it's very difficult to find people who during a certain period of time, for example, during five years or 10 years, uh, listen to very similar music. Uh, like we can maybe say in the 60s, 70s, um, we still find generations of 60s and 70s, uh, basically because of the excess of formation are quite coherent. Um, so. I definitely think there is a, a generation uh, that could be called the uh, DACO generation, Ukon generation, uh, of which I belong to as well. Uh, so I, I was born in the uh, 80s. So those who are born in the 80s, 70s, I would say, uh, might all belong to this generation because when we are teenagers or when we are really longing for those music, uh, we had the same access. You know, we, we always share the same platforms. Um, but for generations that were born in the 2000s, uh, suppose uh, I, I suppose they would not share the same, the similar um, music information or taste uh, with these DACO generations. And uh, I also think there is some distinctive features about these DACO generation um, by the fact that it they are, uh, the music knowledge of these generation are basically fragmented. And it's also uh, very much out of context. Um, so we can maybe hear some tracks, listen to some tracks from some bands, from some albums in the compilation of CDs uh, of a music magazine or on the music uh, forums or on the music, uh, radio emission, but uh, we never had this systematic um, access or systematic knowledge about a certain genres, uh, a certain schools. So this, uh, it's a self-taught music knowledge on one hand. On another uh, hand, the imaginations or the stories we make about different genres are completely out of context and also uh, in some way out of expectations. Uh, one of the recent uh, podcasts I, le I listened, uh, which I highly recommend, by the way, uh, demonstrates that uh, in the 2000s, early 2000s, uh, some bands in, in China uh, feel free to mix elements in punk and elements in metal, and they are strangely uh, combined and, and, and uh, displayed in one song, for example, which can be hardly find in, in the US uh, because punk and, and metal are considered as uh, a mismatch and they don't like each other in general. But uh, because these generations are developed their music knowledge out of context 
and out of expectations, in some way, uh, it's also very freeing for them to make something out of all these elements or fragments and create something that they want. So it's a, it's a very special phenomena and it's also a very special uh, way of looking at the world um, based on this very special cultural phenomena uh, of that whole. So I, I definitely think it's a distinctive generation and we could uh, find some common features about this generation. But I, I don't know, different people might have different opinions. Some, some people also think it's just um, another story or another myth that we created uh, to find a sense of belonging. That's, that's also another interpretation. What's also interesting is that the, the term of Dako generation, Dako de Idai, was created more or less in 99. Um, with the well, it, it was published in a in a book by uh, um, Owning, uh, which was called the uh, Beijing uh, New Sound Movement, Beijing Sinchan. Sure. Yeah. yeah. And uh, and in fact, it's interesting to see that in '99 they were already talking about uh, the end of a Dako generation, even if it was not over yet. But just the memory of it uh, was maybe uh, driving people uh, to talk about uh, the, the, this last generation, which in fact uh, um, le leads me to my uh, last question about Daco nostalgia. So do you have anything uh, to say about uh, this nostalgia for this uh, kind of idealized past uh, of the Daco, <laughs> which you, you, in fact, you embody yourself? <laughs> This stack of generation. Yes, yes uh, I I can relate it to that nostalgia about Daco generation um, because I'm personally involved uh, with this generation. Um, I I think it's a I think it's maybe a particular case uh, in China uh, because we have these Daco phenomena uh, and they are a group of youth that are closely involved in this, with this DACO phenomena. Um, but it's also maybe not only uh, related to China, because we can see that globally now we have this uh, retro trend uh, in terms of fashion, in terms of music and film, uh, people are really mm, getting nostalgic about maybe 60s or 70s, or maybe about some period where uh, it seems that this idea, idealized um, way of living, or there are something that is uh, not so materialistic, even though it might be just an, a, a narrative. Um, but um, during a certain period in history, this narrative about the not so materialistic point of view or this uh, very romantic or ideal, idealized way of looking at the world and also look at about yourself uh, is thriving. Um, for me personally, 60s and 70s is one of those, um, this period, well, this trend is, is thriving. Uh, while now uh, we are clearly living in another, another world, another um, reality, well, the materialistic view uh, or uh, the very realistic uh, way of looking at the world and life are, are, are overcoming, are, uh, let's say, waning the idealistic side. So I think this longing or this nostalgia for Dako, for Chinese, uh, for the Dako generation, and the globally nostalgia for the golden age is also related to this, I would personally describe it as a, a crisis, <laughs> identity crisis, or, or in some way, uh, um, I would not say mental crisis, um, some moral crisis maybe, uh, or ideology crisis about where you can really uh, find meanings and how you put purpose, what is your purpose of life um, especially given the current uh, geopolitical situation of the world, uh, we can clearly see that uh, 
there are there are crises on every aspect, um, especially in terms of ecology, and in terms of um, yes, the there there are, there are a lot of crises now uh, in my in my opinion. So this notal nostalgia is is basically a reaction. I think it's a re collective reaction about these crises. Mm, so I, I personally can relate it to that, and I also think uh, it's a natural reaction about the current uh, political, um, geopolitical, social, and ecological crisis. And yes. that's why I, I also think this conversation maybe makes some sense, because it actually um, remind us that we had a um, certain period of time, we had this period uh, well, people valued more um, ideal, idealized uh, things than the materialized, materialistic things, because um, a lot of people I know and myself, uh, when we are really into these um, uh, daco CD or cassettes, we can easily spend all the our monies or savings to buy one CD or, ca or, or cassettes. And uh, we don't really care about how, which bag you, you, <laughs> you carry or which brand of clothing uh, you're wearing. So there are uh, like possibilities of people that will travel more, uh, the idealized way of living then, a very realistic, a very materialistic a logic. And uh, which I think is also one of the one of the incident uh, consequence that DACO phenomena create, because why those generations of youth are attracted by outside music, be it pop or rock, it's basic because there is some unsatisfaction uh, in the society in the late 90s, let's say, in China, um, because we don't have enough informations or the music we can listen to is not really related to our everyday life experience. There are a lot of expectations from parents, from the society, from schools. There is also this uh, political pressure that we cannot deny. So you want something else that liberates uh, your longing of freedom to liberate your idea, to, to, to allow you to be different. But when we, have information about all these music, and not only music, uh, there are a lot of films uh, also that have been produced and, and circulated in black market in China during the same period. And all these cultural products in some way um, has liberated these individual desire of being, uh, being free uh, to express yourself. But at the same time, because of there is a gap, uh, this generation are not yet caught in this capital logic, I would say. Like um, every taste that you have, every music you listen is basically uh, structured already in this uh, capital logic society. So you, you, you can't really escape that. that the, even your imagination is, is already designed. But during this, uh, this specific period of time, a generation, uh, have escaped that capital logic for a while. And then if we look at the music market now, in nowadays, mainland China, I think this capital logic is everywhere already. Then it's maybe more difficult to just do your music or to just to express yourself without the burden of having to refer to a certain, uh, certain order or having to refer to a certain system that's uh, either uh, the capital logic will give you or either this uh, political oppressive order will make you uh, to, 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 to receive. So I think this is the special um, features about the DACO generation. Yeah, I, I, I just also want to, to mention uh, Yen Tun, uh, which is also a music critic, a musician. Um, that uh, also played an important role uh, in the 90s uh, with a lot of fanzines. So he published Sub Jam uh, in uh, Lanzhou, and then he also published Punk Generation um, uh, in Guangzhou. And uh, he also wrote a lot about Daco and his own nostalgia 
uh, of DACO, saying that DACO represented uh, a generation of people um, that were not commodified, uh, that were uh, idealistic. Uh, it's, it's always something interesting to see that, you know, each generation sees itself as idealistic, uh, uh, contrary to the nowadays generation, which is supposed to be uh, individualistic. And it, what's interesting also is that uh, he recently uh, began to uh, uh, digitalize his uh, DACO collection and uh, put it on the uh, internet. So, uh, so it's interesting that, you know, this nostalgia is also a nostalgia of another way to listen to music, a way that is not uh, uh, individualized, as you said, like by Spotify or this type of thing, but just about finding uh, uh, a record uh, mm. like that and uh, listen to it, uh, which is also interesting uh, that this generation did at some point. Yes, I I don't know how how do you think, but I really find that it's much more difficult nowadays to really listen to the whole album. Uh, from the first track to the end. Um, but when I recall my teenagers' uh, years, I can easily listen to one album uh, like 50 times very easily uh, because the limitation of resources, of course, but yeah, also yes. because of these, um, this absence of the overdose of information. <laughs> that, that this, this choice is limited, so you... <laughs> you, you have no choice. You have to focus on what you have. But uh, I still remember a lot of lyrics of songs I listened to many, many times during that period. But now it's very difficult to focus first and also to, to establish a certain, uh, let's say, affection, deep affection with, with your, your record or with any cultural product. That is what I... I find uh, through my own listening experiences. And maybe that's why this nostalgia about a, a time where techni uh, technology and information are relatively limited, but you actually maybe you got more values or you got more uh, personal deep experiences than nowadays. Mm. But new generation might totally disagree they might yeah yeah they might find it's great <laughs> they embrace the, the diversity uh, of of the current information world so it may be like you said every generation uh, think they are the best <laughs> it's maybe <laughs> nothing new <laughs> about about that generation either <laughs> yeah I, I, I think that there is something about uh different from the Daco generation but that at the same time, there is like something systemic about uh, viewing uh, yourself as the golden age with generation, uh, contrary to the the, the next generation. Uh, <laughs> but, but I really like what you what you said about yeah, the appropriation of music uh, during the Daco generation, and uh, and uh, the the way we consume music nowadays. Um, maybe we'll. Uh, we're gonna go to the questions by the audience. Okay. If that's all right with you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so, so we have a question. So, so of course, uh, people who are uh, listening to us uh, on YouTube, uh, feel free to ask your question in the comment section. I will uh, read them um, one by one. So uh, a first question by Michael. Uh, what about music circulation in China these days? Which is something that we just talked about. Uh, in mm -hmm. terms of technical access, uh, what platform, but also editorial power? How do people discover new music from abroad? Nowadays, yeah, I mean, so current, the current... currently, yeah, yeah. What's okay. the difference? Yeah, what platform? What access do we have? And uh, what are the editorials' power? How people discover these new songs? Yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you for the question, Michael. I'm not sure if you are the Michael I know, <laughs> but if you are, uh, greetings. Thank you for, for joining. Um, I think the editorial, I would talk about the editorial power first. Um, I think there were there was definitely an editorial power during the period uh, where the, rock, uh, the music magazines are still, 
are still a, a major channel of information. But uh, if we talk about the current days, um, I don't think the editors of music magazines or even its digital magazines or uh, uh, online music like broadcasting website have uh, at least have as much power have as those editors uh, during the nineties. Um, basically because people uh, have more freedom to choose the music they would like to listen. And it's also very difficult to, to, to uh, channel one person's idea uh, through a big group of people. Uh, that's my, my personal observation. So it's highly personalized and it's also uh, fragmented. Uh, but I didn't do the research about it. I don't have the data to, to show that if they have uh, less power or they have zero power at all. But I definitely think they have less power comparing to the period where the paper-based magazines are still, are, are still very popular. And in terms of uh, music platforms, uh, in I, I'm talking about the PRC, uh, the mainland China. Um, we still don't have access to, to Spotify <laughs> as, uh, sim as very similar to other platforms like Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube. Um, but people can if they want. So everyone who have lived in China knows the existence of VPN. So they all, it's far um, more uh, diverse than we thought. Uh, it's not only a highly uh, authorized regime that people have no and no choice at all. It's, not, it's far away from that uh, narratives. Mm, but the main uh, platforms that we use to listen to music are still quite uh, localized, I would say. Uh, so the, the mainstream platforms, including uh, Google, Google Yue, it's a broadcasting platform, very similar to Spotify, but Chinese version. And QQ Yue, uh, QQ is a social media uh, uh, ap application uh, established by Tang Xun, one of the biggest uh, companies, telecommunication companies in China. Uh, so people also listen to QQ through QQ music um, and other platforms, and also uh, Douban Yue another uh, platforms for uh, relatively more independent musicians. And of course, there are a lot of live houses. Um, there, there, are lot, there are a lot more live houses and uh, performance places now than the first decade of the, to the 2000. We have to admit that, that the development of economy also um, brings about uh, more possibilities for music industry. Uh, and uh, very recently, we started to have a lot of TV series, the TV reality shows about uh, all aspects of cultural, uh, including music, um, films, uh, entertainment, and also hip hop, for example. So um, TV series or those TV uh, semi reality show is also a very important platforms nowadays for Chinese music amateurs to get access to music. And the uh, bands that were very active during the nineties, now they all performed in this TV series and become uh, revalued in some way. A lot of like younger generations, they get to know those, uh, these formal bands through this TV series. So these are their informations or some introductions about what are the channels or platforms we use now to listen to music. Do you have anything yeah. to compliment, uh, Nat? Yeah, I, th I, I think you, you, you're right uh, on the on the one part that you know the, the editorial power of the music critics is really being downplayed uh, right now. Even if these journals, a lot of these journals are not published anymore, but they are present in the in the in Weixin, for example, in the, the, the Gongzhonghua. You have mm. uh, Sorak magazine that is uh, uh, publishing on Weixin uh, now. Um, so, so you have a, lo a lot of music critics publishing their uh, rock critics uh, on these uh, kind of uh, platforms, um, but they have uh, less power. Uh, I, I, I agree with you. Uh, maybe the, the, the editorial power is uh, in the end of these uh, TV shows. 
uh, that uh, act as gatekeeper so they they, they, they can say who uh, can be er uh, heard or not uh, which is something uh, quite not new but uh, for the musical access it's something uh, that i think is changing uh, right now that the, the power is in the ends of the the the, the tv shows and the the these administrations and all that that can say uh, who can uh, be broadcast or not uh, so it's i think more difficult uh, to produce music uh, because of this gatekeeping uh, uh, administrations yeah. um I have another question by Grégoire. Um, so interesting. Um, will there be any legal consequences for buying, selling DACOs uh, at the time? Uh, and would the Xiaolao ban just sell the tapes or also re-recorded them? Oh, okay. Very interesting questions. Uh, yes, there will be legal consequences, of course. Um, so if you are uh, court, you are you, you can be arrested and you will be punished by uh, by the by the relative laws. So people are still trying to uh, to pay attention to this. So uh, you that's why people don't really sell it publicly. Mm. That's one of the reasons. Um, but if you just uh, you just sell some, for example, like my experience, you see someone having like five or four cassettes or CDs on the street, uh, normally you will not be spotted. And it's very safe to just run mm. away as well. If you, if you suspect that you, you, are, you, are, uh, you are spotted by, by some local police. Mm. Um, but it's still, yeah, yeah. So you, you still have to pay the, the legal prices if you are mm. caught. Um, the next question is about the, the Xiao Lao Ban. They, did they just sell the tapes or they also recorded them to, oh. to make, you know, more and more tapes? Yes, yes, of course. Uh, actually, one uh, music critics and also editors of the rock magazine, uh, Peng Hongwu, which I interviewed uh, quite recently, uh, he said that he had a lot of music critics friends and one of the activities they they share is to re-record uh, it, those uh, pirates or uh, DACO cassette CDs, uh, according to their personal taste and um, just exchange between themselves. And uh, himself, he also sold many DACO CDs mm. and also a pir not pirate, but DIY CDs mm. uh, along with the rock magazines that he used to be the editor. And so, yeah, it's a very common activities. But the but the Xiao Ban in Shanto, uh, they mm. didn't do that. They just sold the the real uh, Daco. In fact. Oh, the small bosses. Sorry, yeah. I lost the small bosses with the sellers in yeah. the in the in the city shops. The small bosses do they re-record them? That's mm. a good question. I don't know. To be very honest. I didn't have enough information about it. Yeah, yeah I don't. Uh, I don't either. Yeah, I. I don't think they, they. They were some. Yeah, I don't. I don't think it was a thing, like to record them before, because mm -hmm. the, the 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 thing about Daco is that it was like uh, original uh, CDs and tapes uh, that were sold. Yeah. I think one of the reasons that people really pay uh, high prices for certain. Daco uh, cassette with CD is not only because of the music, is also because of the, for example, the edition yeah. or the cover uh, photos. Uh, so if you kind of make your own pirate version of Daco, I'm not sure that people will buy it. Uh, it's also because it's also a question of authenticity uh, related to these these cut CDs and, and cassettes. And I, I just wanted to add uh, about the consequences of buying and selling the DACOs. So they, 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 I, I saw a lot of testimonies about uh, DACO sellers on the streets um, that ran away from the police, of course. And uh, a, a, another testimony very interesting about uh, someone who was uh, shipping DACOs. So in fact, yeah. so, 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 so selling them 
uh, over the, the the post office and so at one point like the the the, the post office uh, confiscated uh, the daco because it was illegal and so they had to pay a uh, um, not a fine, but just a, a, to, to, to corrupt the, 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 the post office. So, so pay, pay them a little money uh, so that they could uh, 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 take back the, the DACO. Yeah, so that, that was also something. Yes, that's also one of the, um, I think this was one of the phenomena in Chinese societies where a lot of people from outside maybe uh, didn't understand that you have various ways to to bypass the yeah. the uh, the authorities or the censorships, uh, and it's not just a one way uh, process. And uh, even within this taco business, um, who sold them and who distributed them? It's still it's still unknown. Uh, the testimonies I get um, from from several interviews or materials I can find didn't show that who were uh, precisely who were yeah. involved in this circulation of uh, recycled plastic trash and who uh, is supposed to uh, let them pass, you know, at the, the customs who were <laughs> those people. I think there are a lot of like gray zone. Uh, yeah. But one interesting thing is uh, even though, even people who worked in the big companies, they are not aware of the DACO phenomena. Uh, again, it's, it, this is from interview of a AP, of the broadcast I listened recently. Uh, um, so the the people who are interviewed is has been worked in a major record company for, for about ten years in the eighties, and he told the producer of the podcast that he knows that a lot of surplus of CDs or cassettes were sold to some smaller uh, smaller shoppers like the and ironically they call those stores uh, cut off mm. uh, shops in the US um, so this cut off uh, stores basically they will buy the surplus of CD and cassettes uh, at a very low price then they will sell it everywhere uh, so the uh, gas stations uh, any bookstores or that very disadvantaged areas at a lower price. And then they don't know where do we, where all those surplus of products are going. And when they know that it's shipped to Asian as a recycled plastic trash, they are just, they just laughed because they didn't know about it. And more ironically, those supposedly recycled trash, plastic trash has become a highly valued and ideally idealized, uh, almost spiritual <laughs> nourishment for a whole generation in China. And now we have even have a trend of nostalgia about these products. So it's a very ironic, it's very ironical, the whole circuit. Yeah. And also this, this, this uh, very ambiguous uh, borderline between commodity Right, you're, it's it's a commodity in the U.S. or you you uh, European market, and a a product that uh, that was loaded by ideology, idealization, and meat. So you have this constant uh, switch between these two sides, and you cannot say that it's a pure commodity or it's a pure uh, spiritual nourishment, spiritual food. So it's constantly switching between the two like most of the cultural phenomena I, mm. I personally find. So yeah, it's very interesting mm. details. And I also heard that you can even, when this business um, has been on the peak, um, there are a lot of demand during a certain time. Uh, the, there are some, even uh, ships with, with all these uh, cassette or CDs were not uh, cut at all. So the, the box was not cut at all. And why? No one knows. Maybe because that's assumption. Uh, those uh, receivers, those bosses at the port cities, they bribed, for example, the customers and to ask them to not cut, not make the card. Because who made the card is also another question. Did they receive this cut in the US or Europe or did they receive some cuts 
at the customs in China or in Hong Kong. We don't know. And if they are not cut, but they are recycled, they are uh, exported or imported as a plastic trash. And what happened during the process? So all these are very interesting questions. Uh, w one more question by Grégoire. Um, there is still a cassette production from indie labels in China right now. And some rappers also release projects on tape. What's your point of view on this revival? So the revival of cassette production in China right now. Oh, I'm very uh, ignorant about this phenomena. I'm sorry to say. Um, but I'm very interested in the hip hop scene, uh, the current hip hop scene in China, which is um, is very very active. I know that uh, the rappers and also uh, live houses uh, in big cities in, in China are very uh, are quite active. But I don't know that they are reproducing cassettes. Yeah, and I would be interested to know more about the reason uh, behind but this reproduction. Yeah, I think it's a, it's a global phenomenon um, that the, okay. the production of cassette and vinyls. Um, mm. But I, I think it's it's interesting to see that in, in in China also you have this kind of revival and also the indie revival of the cassette, like self released uh, cassette. So it's really uh, it's really cheap to produce, and then uh, you can uh, you can produce this kind of cassette. It's just something that we can see also in Taiwan. Uh, with okay. uh, underground labels, uh, labels uh, doing uh, cassette record or DIY cassette records. So this is something that we, we can see a lot uh, around the world. Um, and I think also what's interesting is that China uh, didn't have a vinyl production until I think five years ago. Like they reopened uh, a vinyl production in Guangzhou, uh, which is interesting right. that you see that, you know, vinyl is coming back. Uh, and I think it's linked to what we said about nostalgia. Mm. But, but I have but, something to add. So, yeah, sorry, sure. finish. No, sure, I have sure, sure. Something to add about vinyl, this mm? vinyl retro phenomena, which mm. is very recent, like you said, uh, very new. But ironically, as far as I know, there has never been a vinyl consumption market in China before. The 80s, uh, before recently. Recently, we started to talk about vinyls and people are starting to collect the vinyl uh, records. But um, I never seen any vinyl records in the 90s or the early 2000s in the market. And I don't know many people who, who possess uh, vinyl players. Mm -hmm. So I think this is a phenomena that is closely linked to this global nostalgia about the, the past. Mm -hmm. And it's not uh, some, let's say, uh, first-hand nostalgia. It's, it, I would say it's a second-hand nostalgia mm -hmm. because it's not going back to what something that you have experienced yourself, but something uh, some other people experience. And they, but because you are in this global trend now, everything is synchronized. Uh, people are just following what is trending. That, that's my point of view. But uh, regarding the cassette reproduction, uh, that's definitely a, a nostalgia about the, the real past. Um, and I think it's also why I wanted to name this conversation a gesture of refusal, um, because I think it's a deliberate practice. Um, why choose the format? Uh, of cassette instead of um, CDs or digital format. I think it's kind of a, a gesture to show that you wanted something different or mm -hmm. that you are not happy with the current digitalized platforms or, or music industries. And this, this is um, also what happened, I think, for people who uh, insist that they would listen to DACO or they identify themselves as DACO generation it, there is a message about um, about refusal, and even if it's just a a, gest, a gesture, um, it, but it still had uh, a certain subversive values um, in terms of of um, uh, against you know being have an attitude against the, the established norms or being kind of a different voice, 
in, in, in comparing to the, the mainstream uh, voices. Yeah, I, I, and I think it's important um, to still produce these material objects because as we can see, uh, censorship is more uh, efficient on the digital uh, version. So if you want mm -hmm. to make a song disappear, uh, it's uh, easier to do it if it's there, there's only a digital ver version of the song. While if you have the object, you can still preserve it and, uh, and archive it. So, so I think that's also something that should be uh, uh, think about, that we should think about the, the, the digital uh, version as something that can disappear while uh, the, the physical part, uh, maybe cassette, vinyl or CDs, uh, are important for archive purposes. Oh, that's, yeah, that's very interesting. Thank you for adding this. Actually, um, by just coincidence, I, oh, I received this gift from a friend I just visited in France uh, several weeks ago. It's a first uh, cassette. It's the cassette of C uh, Tri Dian, the godfather or the, uh, the father of Chinese rock and uh, Ado, his first band. And it's a cassette published in 1989. Uh, one of the first editions and we listened to this cassette um, at my friend's place and it's the very good quality the, the, the sound quality is very mm. good and you can see all these um, lyrics uh, what I find interesting is um, it, the lyrics it's very simple cover but the lyrics printed inside of this uh, cover is a mixture of uh, traditional mm. Chinese uh, which I read uh, from left right to left horizontal uh, vertically and the modern Chinese uh, which are read from left to right and horizontally mm. so you can see you can clearly trace this mixture of uh, time so well China has uh, entered into a more globalized period where we it we adopted this uh, modern way of writing and reading while in the Republic area or before Republic area, the traditional Chinese are read uh, vertically from right to left. So you can see a, cl a clearly trace of time and that you cannot see in the digitalized um, format. So I, I totally agree with you that some physical um, presentation of of cultural product are a very, are very valuable. I have uh, uh, another question. The, the last question, maybe because uh, we uh, we maybe over time. Um, so Justin says, um, could you tell us more about the current market for Daco now? Uh, you spoke a lot about nostalgia. Uh, what can we uh, so can we see a new circulation of Daco like on Taobao? What's the mm -hmm. price range now? In other words, what does the DACO market look like today? Okay, um, I think maybe not you're more apt to answer this question than me, as that's one of your research questions. Uh, as far as I know, the, there are very few DACO cassette and CDs are in circulation now, but because of nostalgia, they are, uh, they are still sold in, in Taobao and the price can go up uh, yes. Right. Yes, that's true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so, so I think Daco is now becoming something of a collection for a collector, and not something that is, you know, circulating uh, uh, very widely. Um, so, in fact, you can uh, you can uh, buy some Dacos on Taobao. So, the, the the if you want the Chinese version of Amazon slash eBay. Um, and uh, the price range is, is 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 pretty different. You can you can still buy some Daco at very uh, inexpensive price, but you have like collector versions of Dacos that are very uh, expensive. Like I saw like one uh, Daco CD of U2 uh, War uh, that was sold at like ten thousand yuan. 10,000 yuan. Ten thousand, yeah, because it's like a, a collector version uh, or. Like like Nirvana tapes, of course, like very expensive. You have some Daco CDs that are sold at thousands uh, of yuan. So so yeah, it's 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 kind of expensive if you search for precise 
uh, CD. Uh, but otherwise, you can still buy some inexpensive uh, DACO uh, tapes and CDs uh, that have not researched. Yeah. Oh, I didn't know it's it can go up so so high. Yeah, it can go up to very high. Yeah. But yeah, I, I find what you said interesting that it becomes more a uh, actor of uh, actor of collector mm -hmm. than than just to have uh, cheaper access to music, <laughs> uh, which is also very ironical because this business or these cities are sold to China originally really at pennies, very mm. cheap um, as trash, and uh, after several decades, it becomes uh, a valuable collector's items. Uh, which is the irony of the, for me, it's the irony of the, the capital logic. So yeah. as long as you establish a system of value, for example, uh, if you establish this stack of generation as a, a brand, then uh, the, any product can have a commodification aspect and it can become very easily and very quickly a, a commodity that <laughs> that channels uh, not only its original uh, message, but also a lot of added value. Yeah, it's a textbook example of, you know, capitalistic uh, value making uh, yeah. <laughs> from trash to uh, collector object, yeah. <laughs> yes, we are all living in this period where everything could be commodified. Uh, and if you are trapped by this capitalist logic, then you would be easily uh, trapped by this commodification process. I I'm not saying that I'm, I'm not leaving, I'm not part of it, but I think uh, being aware of uh, this commodification process, which is quite invasive, uh, is, is a key or maybe is a one of the solutions to not being trapped or caught by it. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Pangle, for, uh, for, for, for this uh, conversation. It was very interesting, I think. And uh, um, we are we're going to stop uh, now because uh, we uh, already talked about uh, for one hour and 35 minutes. Um, so thank you again uh, for coming here today, uh, well, remotely, uh, but for participating to our uh, webinar lecture series. Um, it was really interesting. I uh, Again, I want to thank you. Um, I want to thank also all uh, the people that uh, also uh, 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 asked questions and also the audience members. Uh, thank you for coming uh, with us today. Um, so good, uh, good afternoon or good, I don't know, uh, well, what time, <laughs> what time zone uh, we well, are. Lunchtime. Right lunchtime. <laughs> <Yeah>. so, <laughs> so, so maybe you, you want to. Time. <laughs> yeah, for, for me it's dinner time. Uh, so so we have to go and uh, and and eat something. Uh, so thank you again, Pangle, uh, for coming uh, today, and thanks everyone for watching us. Um, so bye, bye everyone. Thank you, thank you, Nat, for providing opportunities for this talk, and thank you for everyone who spent time to join and listen. <laughs> keep keep going. Yeah. <laughs>